Hi folks, this is uh, Riding Real-Time Games for Android Redux, and I'm going to go ahead and get started. I think people are still trailing in, but we got to start. So uh, there is a totally a wave open right now about this, and here's the URL, and you should totally use it, because you can take notes. There's somebody taking notes. You can also ask questions, and I'll try to answer them at the end. So who am I? I'm a developer advocate. My name is Chris Pruitt. Uh, I'm focus is on video games for Android. Before I joined Google, I was a video game engineer. Today, I want to talk about three things uh, related to Android, kind of three big buckets. Those three things are basically hardware stuff, software design, and then Android market for games. And, and for hardware stuff, I want to talk about sort of how the world has changed uh, in the last year or so, the types of devices we have, and also some stuff about performance. Uh, for game architecture, that's the software design stuff. I would like to talk to you about how games can be developed for Android and what the right way to sort of go about that is, and also some of the tips and tricks and pitfalls that game developers often uh, run into. And then Android market for games. Uh, I want to tell you about my, what I learned shipping a game on, on Android market. And to do that, I'm going to use this game that I wrote called Replica Island uh, as a case study. And I'll, I'll, I'll kind of refer back to Replica Island throughout the talk. So. Let's get started. So, so last year, uh, I was up on the stage, and I, I gave a talk about, about games. And, and at that point, there was basically one device available on the, uh, on the market, and that was the G1. Android 1.5 had just been released, and there was less than 5,000 apps on the uh, App Store. So you can tell that in a year, we've come a long way, right? We've got lots and lots of devices on the market now, lots and lots of apps in the store, and a lot of those are games. Now, as game developers, uh, one thing that a lot of uh, people you folks included probably uh, worry about is if there's a lot of devices, well, how do you target all of them? Fortunately, when it comes to graphics performance and, and CPU performance, these, all of the devices in the world have broken pretty cleanly out into two discrete categories, uh, which I'm going to talk call first generation and second generation. This is fantastic because as a game developer, you can choose sort of which category, or, or both categories, to support. And that should give you a, a baseline for performance that, that you can use to target your game design. First generation devices, uh, typified here by the, the HTC Magic, also called the MyTouch here in the US, uh, basically the same hardware as the G1, typically 500 megahertz ARM processor. Um, typically, Android, I'm sorry, these, these devices support OpenGL ES 1.0, 1.1. Almost all of them have a hardware backend uh, to back this up. They almost all have HVGA screens. Uh, I can get about 5,000 textured, unlit, colored verts per frame at 30 frames a second on these devices, and about 1024 verts per frame at 60 frames a second. And, and I'll talk about how I arrived at these numbers later. These devices are generally Android 1.5 or 1.6, although a bunch of them are due to be upgraded to 2.0 in the near future. And they represent about 60% of the market at the moment. This is the, the first generation, sort of the low end. Second generation devices basically started with the Droid uh, and include the Nexus One, and I've got a picture of the Xperia on the other slide. But uh, they're much higher end, much faster CPUs, much faster graphics performance. These devices are supporting OpenGL ES 2.0. Um, they have big screens. And as you can see, I can get about 27,000 uh, verts per frame at 30 frames a second. So there's about a 5x performance improvement in terms of pure graphics performance, at least uh, within the, the study of the tests that I've done. However, these devices have big screens. And that means that they spend a lot of time copying the pixels to fill those big screens every frame. So that means these devices are basically fill limited. And it's very hard to do faster than 30 frames a second on these high-end devices, even though they can, they can render quite quickly. These devices are generally running Android 2.0, 2.1. A couple of them are on 1.6. Uh, and they're about 40% of the market at the moment. Now, the first device, like I said, is the Droid. It shipped in December, late November, I think, of last year. Um, that was the first device in this class, and now these, these devices represent 40% of the market. So you can see that in a short period of time, uh, these higher-end devices have sort of uh, come from, from zero to a very significant part of the market. So as game developers, one of the things that you probably are interested in is, well, uh, you know, CPU and graphics performance is one kind of difference, but, you know, there's a lot of different handsets. There's a lot of different 
other things that game developers might care about, like input system or screen size. How do I deal with those? And I think, I mean, having built a game for these devices and trying to get it to run on, on every single thing under the sun, I think that the three points of device diversity that you need to be concerned about are screen size, input hardware, and OpenGL driver. Screen size is really easy, actually, because the Android framework gives you tons of tools for dealing with different screen sizes. Basically, you can query the size of the screen, and if you're using OpenGL, you can set your viewport to that size. It, it doesn't, it's not very hard. You can also use the alternative resource system to load different size assets and go all crazy if you want to. But if you want to keep it simple, you know, managing multiple screen sizes is not very difficult. Now, input hardware is a little trickier because some of these phones have a trackball, some have a D-pad, some have a keyboard, some have screens with multi-touch, some don't. Uh, some have an optical trackpad, that's a new thing. Uh, and, you know, for a game, a lot of the playability of the game, regardless of the technology that it employs, is going to be based on how well the user can actually control the game itself. And, and the interface between the phone and the user is going to determine a lot of the fun factor for your game. So having a lot of different hardware means that you may have, you may think you have, a significant challenge to, to support all these devices. But actually, the API does a pretty good job of standardizing all these different types of inputs into two types of input events, um, motion events and key events. And I'll talk at some length later about how I manage to sort of try to support all of these different types of diverse input systems uh, for my game. And, and you, you can be pretty much guaranteed that all devices are going to have a touchscreen, uh, accelerometer, orientation sensors, things like that. So if you can make a game that, that only relies on, on those things, then you're going to run everywhere without, without any modification. OpenGL driver, you know, the thing here is that these devices are built by different people and they have different backends, and the drivers are written mostly by the OEMs, and so those things are also different. So for example, um, the, the Nexus One uses a, a Qualcomm backend which has an ATI graphics backend in that, and that driver supports ATI TC texture compression. The Droid, on the other hand, has a PowerVR backend. That thing supports PVR TC texture compression. And guess what, they're not compatible. But if you wanted to use texture compression, um, you, you could ship textures that have, you could ship versions of textures that have both. You could choose not to use texture compression. That's what I did. Uh, or you could use ETC1, which is, seems to be the emerging standard amongst OpenGL ES 2.0 compatible devices. That's the big driver delta that you probably want to be aware of is this texture format uh, issue. Almost the entire world at this point is ATI TC backed, and the, the Droid is the outlier. With, with PVRs DC, but I'm sure that in the future there'll be, there'll be more. ETC1 is probably the way to go here. It, it seems like it's the uh, simplest, most standard solution. It's also not the best format, doesn't support alpha, there's some other problems with it, but uh, that's probably something to be cognizant of when you're, when you're developing. Uh, for my part, I actually didn't use any texture compression. I just loaded all the textures raw and that was fine. Uh, some of these devices support OpenGL 1.1, some support 2.0. That's something you want to be cognizant of. If you're writing a shader-based uh, OpenGL 2.0 game, obviously it's not going to run on the first generation of devices that don't support OpenGL 2.0. And also, GL extensions is a string that you can query from OpenGL. It tells you what the particular device you're running on uh, supports above and beyond the spec. So if you're going to use extensions, uh, and I actually use several of them, uh, to, to get higher performance, you need to query the string before you start using it. Things like what texture format are supported will show up in the string. So that, that's the sort of standard way for OpenGL ES to allow device-specific extensions. And, and what you should do is check to see if they're available, if you want to use them, and then fall back on the regular spec if they're not. Other thing to, be, to consider is that Android versions uh, in the wild are, are different. There's basically three versions available in the world right now. That's Android 2.1, uh, Android 1.5, and Android 1.6. But from a game developer's perspective, you know, there's actually not a whole lot of difference between these three versions. Android 1.5 basically gives you everything you would need to build most every game in the world. The big difference between Android 1.5 and Android 1.6, as far as you're concerned, is that Android 1.6 added support for different size screens. So Android 1.5, every device is guaranteed to be HVGA. From Android 1.6 on, they can be different sizes. And the way that works in practice is uh, when you query the size of the screen from the framework, if you're running an Android 1.6, you'll get uh, a value that might not be HVGA. And if you're running in 1.5, you'll always get HVGA values. So it's a pretty simple step up. In 2.0, we introduced support for OpenGL ES 2.0. That's something that game developers usually care about. There's also multi-touch APIs in 2.0. 
And actually, Android, because you can write almost your entire game on Android 1.5, it's pretty easy to be backwards compatible and, and cover the entire range of devices. If you target Android 1.5 or 1.6, that's a pretty good way to go. And you can see they're pretty big parts of this pie. Uh, but you can also you know, do things like target Android 2 and say that your min SDK is, is 1.5 and then use Java Reflection to make sure that, say, the multi-touch APIs are there before you call them. You've got quite a lot of uh, flexibility in this case. But generally, the, other, the message here is, you know, you don't want to forget about Android 1.5 devices or Android 1.6 devices because they're a big segment of the market. So the big question that, that I work with a lot of game developers, the big question they always have is, so what's the high end? What's the, the upper bound for performance? Uh, so what I did is I wrote, a, I wrote a 3D sort of simple 3D profiler to see what these kind of new devices, particularly I was interested in the second generation devices, to see what they could do. And this is a very simple test. What it is is it takes a height map and it extrudes it in, in 3D, and I can tune the complexity of the scene up. I can say, oh, I need to divide this 10 times, or I want you to divide this height map 1,000 times. So the number of verts in the scene can be scaled. I also have controls for scaling OpenGL state, like texture size and MIT maps and things like that, and, and those aren't really included in this particular test. I was looking just at scene complexity. Uh, and, and what I found was, that all of these devices, I looked at the Liquid, the Nexus One, the Droid, and the Xperia, and just to have one phone representing the, the first generation of devices, I have the HTC Magic in here too. Uh, what I found is basically, regardless of how many verts I draw, they all perform at about the same speed. Uh, the exception here is the Magic. You can see that it starts out very fast at, at 500 verts. It's, it's able to render at 60 frames a second, and then it sort of linearly grows, as you might expect it to. But the other devices, like especially the Xperia, that's the green line there, um, you know, the Xperia's speed is probably linked to its refresh, refresh rate, because even if I draw a scene with nothing in it, it takes 32 milliseconds. That red line on this graph, by the way, the, the, bottom, the bottom axis here is, is verts per frame, and the, uh, the y-axis is frame time. And if you've, done, if you've done game development before, you probably know that in order to render at 30 frames a second, you need to complete your frame in under 32 milliseconds. So that red line there is the 32 millisecond barrier. Any slower than that, and the game may not be playable, especially if it's a uh, you know, kind of action-packed game or something that requires quick reflexes. If it's a slower-paced game or something that is not uh, animation-heavy or the screen isn't changing every frame, then you can certainly get away with slower than 30 frames a second. But most games uh, make 30 frames a second their target. So that's what I've, I've put on this graph. So why doesn't this time change? Like, Why doesn't the, the scene complexity have much to do with the time? I think this is because, as I mentioned earlier, uh, most of the time for this frame is actually being spent copying pixels, not, not rasterizing the scene. And that's because these devices all have big screens and they're all mostly fill bound. Good news is that even if we render a pretty compl complicated scene, it doesn't cost us any more. If you target 30 frames a second, you should be able to you know, get quite a lot of performance out of these devices at that speed. If I increase the number of, uh, of verts in the scene, you know, it's pretty much the same story. Things start to get slower and, and all these devices pass uh, that 32 millisecond boundary eventually. I kind of binary searched this space to find out where the, uh, where the maximum bar was. And the average, to me, seems like about 27,000 textured, unlit, colored verts per frame. Uh, there's a couple of devices that can do a little bit better than that, but that seems to be a good target. This code is all open source. It's on apps for Android. I have the link at the end. But if you'd like to reproduce this on your device, you can do that. There's also a bunch of other tests and stuff in this code that you can use. So the message here is, um, on the low-end devices, if, if your target is 30 frames a second, you can push about 5,000 verts per frame. And if your target is the high-end devices, you can push almost 30,000 verts per frame, We're looking at a five, five and a half uh, x difference. But the, you know, the high-end devices are only 40% of the market at the moment. You'd like to be able to target everything. So what you need to be able to do is scale from the low-end to the high-end. And actually, thinking about writing code that can scale from the low-end to the high-end in order to sort of make your user base as large as possible, has a lot of benefits even for the high end. Um, just, just real quickly, I kind of want to make a point about level of detail. Uh, level of detail, the idea here is that if things are farther away in, in the scene, like, like further away from the, the point of view of the camera, then they're smaller on the screen, right? They're taking a fewer number of total pixels. And in that case, they don't actually be, need to be as a high resolution mesh uh, as they would if they were closer to the scene. So in this case, what I did is I, I took the test and I instanced a little you know, programmer art hill here and uh, made it so that as the hills get further out on the background, they become simpler meshes. And the guy on the left, the image on the left here, has um, 
has no level of detail turned on, and the image all the way on the right has level of detail turned on pretty aggressively. So you can see, you know, if you look at those mountains in the background on the right, they kind of look kind of crappy, because this is basically programmer 3D art. But if you had a little dune buggy or something that was right in the center of the frame that the user's eye was targeted on, I don't think they would notice. And even though these scenes look pretty similar, you know, the, the actual performance is pretty different. So I highly recommend thinking about scaling between the low end and the high end. And you can do this with complexity of the scene like I'm doing here. You can also do it with mip mapping and other, other techniques to say, you know, stuff that's in the, further in the background, you know, make it simpler. And if you're gonna support these lower end devices, you know, one way to do that is just to chop off the high end and allow your, your device to be lower resolution on these lower uh, res devices. They have smaller screens anyway. Also, if you use artists to generate this stuff, it looks a lot better. So I told you about what to expect in terms of performance, at least based on this test. I told you about um, the, the two device classes you can kind of think of as your baselines. Uh, now I just want to give you a couple of best practices about how to actually achieve maximum performance. This is mostly OpenGL-centric stuff. And if you've done OpenGL, especially OpenGLES on mobile devices before, I don't think you'll see any surprises here. Uh, but the number one, if you take one thing away about performance from this talk, it should be that you must use VBOs. VBOs are vertex buffer objects. That's vertex arrays that are stored on the video card in, in VRAM. There's a huge performance improvement to these guys, and they're almost universally supported. Now, that said, you want to have as few VBOs as possible in memory at any given time, because switching between them is a pretty expensive operation. And actually, all OpenGL state change is a pretty expensive operation. So when optimizing your 3D scene, your mantra should be limit state change. Um, there's no advantage to using fixed point verts. You can test this with the height map profiler code. Um, floating point verts are, are actually faster in most cases. Uh, I, I mentioned EDC1 texture compression is the most compatible across all these OpenGLES 2.0 devices. It's not generally supported by the uh, OpenGLES 1.0, 1.1 devices. If you're going to do 2D texture blitting to the screen, like you're drawing a 2D game or you have a HUD elements, the draw texture extension is pretty much usually universally supported and it uh, is the fast path for 2D. And I mentioned that the WVGA devices are fill bound, so your target should be 30 frames a second. Do you use GL extensions to check what you've got to scale between the low and the high end? If you're using 2D games, uh, if you're making a simple 2D game, especially if you're targeting the high end of devices, you could probably get away with just CPU drawing. There's a whole system called Canvas that'll copy your bitmaps on in main memory and CPU. And it's not horribly slow, but it has a, a lower uh, high watermark on the low end devices. But if your game is simple, and if it doesn't need 30 frames a second animation, or not the entire frame is changing every frame, then that's something you can consider. And if you're on, if you decide to target those high-end devices that support OpenGL ES 2.0, then always use OpenGL S 2.0 instead of 1.0. Even though those devices are backwards compatible to GL ES 1.0, 1.1, they, imp they implement it as a uh, emulation layer between, so the, the OpenGL ES 1.1 spec and their actual 2.0 hardware. So if you have a choice between one and two, uh, and you're okay with cutting out the low end that doesn't support two, always choose two. So in Replica Island, I, I used a combination of these methods to draw the scene. Um, this game, I, I worked really hard to make sure that it runs on pretty much every device out there, even, even the G1. I wanted to run on it. In fact, I developed most of the game uh, on a G1. So I used the draw texture extension, which I just mentioned for my 2D sprites. Uh, that includes the guys on the screen and the HUD elements and that door and stuff there. Uh, it also includes the background image, which is basically a, a static texture that scrolls a little bit. You just draw texture for that as well. And then the tile layers themselves uh, are, uh, the, the foreground layers, I'm sorry, is, is actually made out of tiles. And I rendered that using VBOs. And I've spoken before about uh, the different methods that I experimented with to render this background uh, efficiently. And I've actually come up with another method, which is what I shipped with which was to take the entire level and wrap it up into a single large VBO and then draw scan lines of tiles out of it. You can actually draw a subset of vertices within a single VBO and it's much faster than having separate VBOs. So this worked out really well for me. I have a single texture to bind, a single buffer to bind, and then I can draw any part of the level depending on where the camera is looking. Okay, we talked about performance. Let's move on to game architecture. I wanna talk a little bit about how uh, you should go around architecting your software for, for Android games. I'm an advocate of this dual thread approach. Uh, the idea here is you have a game thread and a render thread, and they're separated. And the game thread is doing all your non-graphics simulation update, AI, collision detection, physics, whatever, and then it's telling the render thread uh, what to draw for the next frame. 
So if you look at this chart, we have uh, Android Framework is kind of at the top, and it's going to send input events to your activity thread, which is basically your main UI thread. All Android applications have this, right? And the activity thread is going to basically be dormant until it gets woken up by a input event. And I think you should just take that input event and pass it on to your game to let the game thread you know, figure out what to do with it. The game thread and the rendering thread are going to be kind of running in parallel. And the reason to split these two like this is that the rendering thread is going to periodically have to block on hardware. If you're able to run fast enough that you're ready to draw before the previous frame is complete, then the rendering thread is going to actually stop and wait for the hardware to say, OK, it's ready to start issuing commands again. So during that time, you know, this is a game. There's no reason to leave the CPU idle. Uh, we might as well have another thread that's doing your next frame of simulation running at the same time. This is basically how uh, Replica Island is, is implemented. If you follow this sort of approach, or if you decide generally that you would like to have a, a separated rendering thread, which I, I highly recommend, you can use this GL Surface View class, uh, which we've written for you. This is a class that does all the setup and teardown for OpenGL. It will manage all of your OpenGL state through pausing and stuff like that, and it, it basically just manages this whole thread. It gives you a very simple interface to load textures and to set up the, the viewport and to, to actually draw the frame. Just to give you an idea of how simple this is, this is a Android application. This is pretty much all the code you would need to just get something up on the screen that's rendering with OpenGL using GL Surface View. The only part that I actually have to write other than this you know, sort of activity shell itself is this part that says awesome game renderer um, that's going to render my awesome game. Plug that thing into the GL Surface View, and then it's ready to go. Just needs to know about pause events. So what's uh, the GL Surface View renderer? Well, it's basically these three callbacks that I just mentioned. You get a callback when the surface is created. That's when you load your textures and you set up your VBOs or any other work you need to do that requires writing to VRAM. Um, you get a callback when the surface is changed. That's, that's when your viewport is ready to go, either because it's been ready to go the first time or maybe because the phone's been rotated and you want to handle orientation changes, things like that. Set your viewpoint up there. And then you get a callback to on-draw frame every frame that you want to draw. That's pretty simple, right? Replica Island uses this. Pretty much every 3D game on the market uses this, I think. It saves you a lot of time. You should use it. Now, let's say you don't really want to write your game in Java. Say you're, you, know, you already have your game written in C++, and you want to just bring it over to Android. Uh, well, you can do this with the NDK. And the way that I would suggest to do this is to use the same framework. Use Java threads to split this stuff up. You still are going to have the same problem with the, uh, the hardware blocking sometimes. So you want to separate the rendering out from game simulation. But you don't have to render, implement the rendering or the game simulation in Java. You can just implement it in native code. I would set these up with regular Java threads and then call into native code to implement the contents of these threads. So the way that would change, the example I just showed you a minute ago might be like this. In this case, I've taken this awesome game renderer and I've, I've added some sort of native prototypes. I'm assuming that I wrote this code in C++ and compiled it with the NDK, and then I'm loading the library here in this little static section. And basically, I'm just going to call similar functions that I've defined in my own C code uh, from the Java callbacks. You notice that the GL state is shared here. Uh, I can set stuff up in GL with, um, with Java and then refer to it in, in C land or, or vice versa. It's all the same OpenGL context. So I don't actually have to pass anything. You, you see Java gets a GL pointer, but there's nothing to pass down to uh, the actual native code in this case. So this is how I would recommend um, users go about setting up your Android games if you have a lot of code that's already written or that you're going to write in C++. Now, part of the reason that I'm recommending this, some people are like, why do I have to have this whole Java thread nonsense? I wrote my game already. It's good to go. Is because, uh, well, Android's a, a multi-processing um, you know, operating system. And because of that, there are some cases that you won't see on other mobile devices that aren't multiprocessing. Um, one of them is this pausing problem that I want to talk about. And, and what that is is, say I'm running this game. I have a, on the left here you know, the, sort of the game output. It's a, a scene from the game. And on the right, I have something which is what I imagine the contents of VRAM to be, just a bunch of textures that I've loaded, basically. And I'm playing the game, and everything's great, and I've set it all up, and everything's fine. And then I, I decide I'm going to go home, and I check my email, and then I may run another OpenGL intensive application. 
And at some point, what happens is, depending on how much memory my device has, uh, at some point, you know, maybe the VRAM that I allocated for all those textures in my game, it needs to be used, maybe by this, uh, this profiler test. In, in that case, you know, what Android's gonna do is leave my game running, but go ahead and give the VRAM to the other, uh, to the other process. So when my game comes back, all the VRAM is basically toast. If you use GL Surface View, you will get a callback to on surface created in this case. And that means it's time to reload your texture and buffers. And, and some games are not built with the idea that the texture handles that they've allocated in VRAM are gonna change in the future. So this is something you definitely need to be cognizant of. But if you use GL Surface View, it'll sort of work out all the details. And when you come back from a pause, if your uh, GL context is dead, it will tell you and give you a chance to load textures and buffers again. Now in Replica Island, I actually made it more complicated than myself because GL Surface View actually proactively throws state away when it pauses on the theory that other applications need to use it. But I, I had a case where I wanted GL, uh, the GL data to stick around while I brought up another activity. That was this dialog box case. The game is paused in the background and this dialog box activity has come to the foreground. But I really don't want to reload textures just when a you know, dialog box pops up. So I modified GL Surface View in this case to only uh, reload textures when the, the context is detected to be lost. And that, that works out fine too. While I'm talking about things I learned on, on Replica Island, I want to sort of shift gears and talk about something that's not graphics related, and that was input customization. This is something that I did not anticipate. Um, users really, really want to be able to customize their controls. And, and, and the game, just if you haven't tried it, the game is mostly trackball, touchscreen based game. You can play it with a D-pad, or, or now you can play it with the keyboard. Um, and I, I added some tilt controls in there after a couple of updates to allow people like Xperia owners who have no trackball or D-pad to play. But what I found out is, first of all, there's a lot of devices with a lot of different controls out there, and all of those users want to be able to play my game, uh, and all those users are going to want to be able to play your games as well. So allowing people to customize the controls to fit their phone is a good idea. But above and beyond that, what surprised me was users actually want to be able to customize their controls, even if they have the default setup that you had in mind when you, when you built it. I have users telling me that they have a droid that has a D-pad and has a, you know, a keyboard, and they'd rather use the tilt controls, because that's what they're comfortable with. That's something I didn't anticipate. So I've made, since I released the game uh, in March of this year, I've made four updates, and all of them have been to extend the amount of uh, input customization that I support. Side effect of that is that my input system got kind of complicated. I started out with a pretty simple system where uh, the game wants to have a query-based interface. The game wants to be able to say, when was the last time the jump button was pushed? Or how long has the jump button been down? Or what was the last vector of the trackball roll? Something like that. that you know, Android doesn't really give you events in that way. It doesn't really provide a query interface for you. It says, here's a delta update. The trackball's moved a little more, or, or the, you know, this keyboard button has come up. So I put a little system in between those two just to record the current hardware state. And the initial version, you know, all it did is really ex uh, expose and trackball API to the game. So the game could say, uh, you know, what's the current trackball state? And halfway through development, I added a couple other APIs for what's the touch screen doing and what's the orientation sensor doing. And that's pretty much how the first version shipped. And then I started to add all these uh, customization stuff, and I realized I want to add heuristics in there as well because, you know, maybe the trackball is a little bit too sensitive on some devices. So I'm going to have a, a heuristic for turning, turning where, tuning where the, uh, the dead zone is. And I didn't really want to increase the number of APIs I supply to the game because then the game is going to get really ugly and complicated. So instead, I made the input system really ugly and complicated. Um, and this is, you know, horrible, right? Like, if I'd planned on this, I could have done it better the, the first time out, but I didn't, I didn't plan on it. So in the most recent update, I, I ripped all this crap out and, and rewrote it like this. Now there's a generic input system that, that takes input state from the Android framework and records it, but doesn't do anything with it. And there's a separate interface called the, the input interface that, that takes the stuff from the input system and applies whatever heuristics or filters or configuration control options and, and provides a game-specific API. Jump button is down, you know, the user wants to go left, things like that. This is all open source. Um, all this stuff is up on code.google.com. So if you're going to make a game and you would like to have the same sort of query interface, you can just you know, grab this input system and, and reuse it. Um, you, you probably write your own input interface depending on what inputs your game wants. This is something that I had not anticipated that I got a, a lot of bang for the buck out of from my users. So last section here is I'd like to talk about um, Android market for games. And I, uh, I didn't really know a lot about Android market for video games. 
Uh, I knew like what games were up there, and I knew that you know there was different ways to try to promote games, and I didn't really have any idea how what makes a successful game in terms of Android market user base. So I tried a bunch of stuff. Um, you know, the Replica Island project, the entire point was to be an experiment. You know, first, can I write this sort of game on Android, and then how do I write it, and then finally, uh, how do I publish it? What's the what's the best way to do that? So. The first thing I did is I, I took a look at the traits of the most successful games on Android Market. This is a pretty small view of the market, right? Um, this is only the top 10 titles in, across all game categories, and I sorted them by most popular, which is the market ranking, and, and most downloaded. And basically what I can see is that pretty much all of these apps are backwards compatible to 1.5. That's a big deal. There's a lot of users who are still back in 1.5 and 1.6. So the successful apps, at least in the top 10, uh, you know, almost all support that. Almost everybody has screenshots in their, in their market uh, listings. That's a really big deal, too, because users want to see what it is. Even if it's a free app, they want to see what they're getting before they download it. You see the most downloaded free list here actually has the fewest number of screenshots. It's only 50%. My theory there is that a lot of those apps have actually predate our market screenshot system. Um, they've been up there for such a long time that a lot of users download them before they were even screenshots. And for paid apps, you know, I, I was making a free app, so this wasn't particularly relevant to me, but I was interested. For paid apps, most of them supply a free version, some sort of light version or something, that, free demo, something like that. And it looks like the average price for the most popular paid apps is less than 350. So my, my idea was, well, I'm making this game, I want it to be successful. It's going to be free. I'm going to open source it anyway. So it doesn't really matter. I'm not interested in making money on it, per se. But you know, I would like to understand, as an experiment, what I need to do to make this, to make this thing popular. Uh, I gave a talk here at, at Google I.O. last year. And I, I mentioned this game. And I, I showed a demo. And I made the mistake of saying it was almost done. Wow. It's all up on YouTube now. And it's totally like closed caption of me saying it's almost done. Um, and I had this function in my head that looked like this, I guess. Uh, because I really released it like two months ago, right? The lesson here is don't ever say it's almost done. But the reason that I didn't release it, it was because I wasn't ready to. And, and part of the reason for that was that I didn't know anything about marketing and I had a lot to learn. My initial marketing plan was um, to make a website, so to have a blog about it, um, and then to send out some press releases to like a couple of Android blogs, like five of them, and uh, you know to have a QR code that you could scan to download the game. That was it. And my, the, you know. The base plan for this was that my marketing spend was going to be zero dollars. That was the most important part to me. Um, actually, it turned out that I, I didn't have a lot of confidence in writing the, the press release myself. So I got this guy, Nikolai, my, my PR manager, to write it for me. And Nikolai said that he'd do it um, pretty much for free as long as I bought him the entire set of Ming's Quest uh, DVDs off Amazon.com. So I looked, and that cost $39.99, so my marketing spend is up to $39.99. Um, and so we did it, and actually he, he wrote the press releases and sent them out, and you know, it was pretty successful. And once we got past our agreed upon cap, he's like, okay, where's my Ming's Quest DVDs? And I, I went back and looked on Amazon again, and actually I'd made a mistake on that they don't actually have, as far as I can tell, a, a Ming's Quest DVD set. I was looking at simply Ming, so my marketing spends back down to zero dollars. Sorry, Nikolai. <laughs> so I, I ended up releasing the app in, in uh, March of this year, and, and it's done pretty well. Uh, I passed uh, half a million downloads within two months, which was very exciting. User feedback has been pretty good. I'm at four and a half out of five stars. Um, and I want to just, I mean, I'm going to show you the graph. Yeah, hooray, volume. But you can tell that there's some, some points at which the angle of the graph changes. And I wanted to talk about what those points were. Uh, the first 10 days, like I said, Replica Island is an experiment. My, my goal is to be able to use it in a case study at a talk like this to tell you guys, you know, when you go out to make a real game, Here's what you should do. I had no idea that it was actually going to be this you know, well accepted. But as an experiment, I decided to track the difference between my $0 marketing plan and organic growth. So for the first 10 days, I didn't say anything. I launched the game. I just uploaded it to market. I didn't write in my blog. I didn't talk about it. I was at another conference, and I mentioned it to the people who were there that I'd released it. So like those 200 people knew that I'd released it. But there was no fanfare, no marketing, no, no nothing. Because uh, I wanted to see what happened if I just uploaded it. Just said nothing about it. And the first 10 days, I got about 18,000 downloads. That seemed to be about the rate of organic growth, which, which wasn't bad. Uh, but, but 
10 days on, I said, okay, Nikolai, send out your, your press releases, uh, and he did. Uh, and you can kind of see what happened here. The, we, have a, we had one YouTube video and this press release that he wrote. And as soon as he sent that out, the, the angle went up a little bit. You know, a bunch of, a bunch of blogs um, were very nice and, and wrote about the game. And a bunch of people looked at the YouTube link and a bunch of people retweeted it. And that was pretty cool. Gizmodo wrote an article about it. That was cool. There's a big spike. Apparently, a lot of people read Gizmodo. Um, and the angle actually stayed pretty, pretty nice after that uh, until I, I got featured on Android Market. Now, full disclosure, I'm part of the Android team. I didn't have anything to do with the decision to feature Ripple Island. I was very excited about it when it happened. And that is what has caused the, the graph to go to its current angle, which is about 10,000 downloads a day. Uh, other interesting thing here is that shipping updates you know, didn't actually help my download speed at all. Um, some developers have come to me and said, you know, well, I'm worried that less scrupulous developers are going to ship superfluous updates just so they can get into the just-in category. And um, I, you know, these are updates, like I said, to add control options. So I thought that they would be very high value. And, and the market comments suggest that users really like them. But I did not see any sort of spike from shipping an update in my, in my downloads. This evidence is, is you know, only, only my application. But from my point of view here, it doesn't look like shipping updates uh, you know, helps a lot. So I don't think you're going to artificially inflate your downloads that way. So going back to this couple of months calculation, the real problem that I had with, with shipping the game in a couple of months was not technical. When I showed it uh, last year, it, it was pretty much running. The tech was pretty much there. It ran on the G1. It, you know, it scaled up to the newer devices when those devices came out. I didn't have a lot of technical problems to solve at that point. The problem was the game wasn't all that great. Uh, I thought it was kind of boring. It, it was mediocre. It, part of the issue here was that my tools were not that great. Um, this is the level editor. I wrote it in three days in JavaScript. Uh, it totally works, and it was pretty limiting in the long run. The problem was that I, I had developed these levels, and they, they worked, and they weren't as fun as I wanted them to be. And in order to make them more fun, I was going to have to spend more than three days on the tool, and I really didn't want to do that. So instead of, of making the tools better, I decided to release the game to some users and try to get user feedback. When I worked in the game industry, one of the things we would do is bring kids in and uh, have them play the game and watch them play and see where they fail and fail. And it was really obvious. You'd watch a kid run into a brick wall for a while because he doesn't actually see the wall there because your texture hasn't been you know, high enough contrast or something like that. And it was very instructive for making the game better. But on a handheld device like this, it's really hard to you know, sit over someone's shoulder and watch them play the game as they play. So instead, I decided to make an automated system. So I made a system where every time a player dies, I was particularly interested in where, where the players are going to die. Everywhere that they die, it just ping a server and say, hey, player died here, player died here. And every time they completed the level, it would say, player completed the level, it took them this amount of time. And the output of that I graphed as, as a heat map over my uh, level geometry. And this was super awesome because it totally told me where the difficult parts of my game were and where the not so difficult parts of my game were. Um, you know, like this little valley over here, that's like the valley of death. Tons of people die there. <laughs> I didn't intend it to be that hard, but it turned out to be. So, I mean, I learned a lot from this. I looked at, I looked at this feedback and I said, OK, uh, my camera system needs work because too many people are dying from falling in pits. And, you know, the control system isn't tight enough. And this level over here that I intended to be really easy is really hard, which indicates that people aren't learning how to use this particular game mechanic because I'm not teaching it well enough to them. And in a very short amount of time, I got a huge volume of information of, that I could turn into sort of minor adjustments that improve the quality of the game a lot. I was so happy with the system that I actually shipped the final game with it turned on. You can turn it off in the options if you don't really want to share this information with me. But the, if you don't turn it off, the, um, the game will actually ping the server and tell me that an anonymous user has died in this location. So now I have tons and tons and tons of data from real users about where I failed at level design. And this is super instructive because users are also looking for developers who are interested in continuing to improve their games. So if I make an update based on this and push it out and say, OK, everybody who got stuck on level 22, I totally am there for you today, um, you know, a lot of users are really happy about that. And I'm very excited to be able to, to actually continue to work directly with my users like that. That's something that in other game spaces is basically impossible. You should listen to your users generally. Um, it's really useful to listen to users because they have really good feedback. Some of it's really harsh and some of it's really hard to take, but, but a lot of it is really, really positive and really useful. Um, I learned a lot from looking at, at market comments. Uh, Android market users are also hilarious. Uh, 
my daily routine now is, is you know, downloading or opening up market and, and reading the comments to see what's been posted lately. Sometimes I learn something and sometimes I just, it's just really funny. Sorry about your G1 mouse thing, dude. Um, also, and this is another thing that I did not expect, uh, users are fascinating. The, this, particularly this user group is fascinating because you have, you have a view into them with Android Market that you don't get with other game spaces. Um, like this top one here says, complete a game, now what? Need more levels or uninstall? And the one below that, John, says, fix level 22 with the spikes, make it so you can play through the levels, then I'll give it five stars. These, these ones, this is basically like a threat, right? Like, I'm gonna uninstall your game. <laughs> like, okay, I, be, I beat the whole game, you know, yeah, give me more content or I'm gonna uninstall. And the bottom ones are like, challenges and bugs are the same thing. Like, like level 22 is pretty hard. I made it pretty hard, it's pretty late in the game. I made it hard intentionally, but these users see it as, as a bug. If I can't progress, then the game is broken. That's fascinating to me. And I don't, I don't think these users are necessarily wrong. I mean, this is not the way that I had thought about game design, but if I'm really trying to reach the maximum number of users, I should probably consider their point of view. So some lessons I learned from, from users are that user bug reports are highly, highly unreliable. That said, if you can find a user who is willing to you know, work with you and send you logs and, and try to say, you know, here's how I'm reproducing this bug, those people are invaluable and you should totally, totally you know, have an email correspondence with them at the very least. Um, also, I found that users tend to chalk up bugs, that either, even if they're not bugs, to which device they're using. Uh, and almost entire, all the time, almost all of the bugs I shipped affected all the devices. You know, and I have very, very few device-specific bugs. So, you know, like here's a demo here or example here where the guy says, first guy says, works great in the Samsung moment, and the next poster says, doesn't work on Samsung moment. Well, which is it? Right? <laughs> Turns out it works pretty good on the moment. Um, so, different strokes. This is what I was talking about, different user perspectives. Some of these users are extremely casual. Some of them just want to be able to consume the content. They don't want any sort of challenge. And other users are extremely hardcore. Like, it, they tell me that the game is too easy. You know, I, I included three different endings and they unlock all three in like two hours and say, now what? You know, uh, it, Replica Island actually has dynamic difficulty adjustment in there, which is a system by which if the game sees that you're really sucking, it'll, it'll try to dial down the, the difficulty without telling you about it. Players don't like to hear that they're being handheld, but my, my goal is to get them to continue to move through the game, because if they get frustrated, then they're gonna uninstall for sure, right? That's a good idea, but that's not necessarily, that's not, that's not nearly enough. Um, and my future updates are gonna be to be even more proactive about either giving higher, more rewards to users that are hardcore, maybe that's achievement systems, or maybe it's social sharing with, with other friends, or some other way for them to sort of go out of their way to wanna beat the game more than once, or to you know, beat the game without taking a hit or something like that. And also, maybe an option to remove all challenge uh, completely from the game, maybe select any level, or say, I, I wanna be able to fly forever, or whatever it is for the users who just wanna consume the content who aren't interested in a hardcore challenge. Other thing to remember is your market placement is not static. Uh, I have a, like I said, I have a 4.5 uh, review score at the moment, which is fantastic, but for about three days there, I lost half a star and I was down to four. And that, oh, it pissed me off. I was like, oh, I gotta get those guys back. And I, I had a, I had a, um, update that I've been working on and I fast tracked the update and I shipped it and my half star came back and I felt so good about it. But the, th the thing you gotta, you gotta remember is that the, the users are, are actively playing and rating your content even after you've sort of consider it done. Um, so if you wanna stay at a high placement in market, um, you're gonna have to be actively involved. And it doesn't always mean shipping updates. It might mean you know, making your description text more explicit or telling users um, you know, how to uh, how to play the game better or, or providing some other sorts of, of support. But users are, are there and they're active and, and the market placement, you know, moves. And then communicating as many ways as possible is, is the last point here. This is actually really hard. But when you make an update, unless you're really verbose about it, users aren't gonna understand what you changed. Um, the number one complaints I have right now are all related to control customization options that I solved two updates ago. And the control customization screen itself is not discoverable, discoverable enough. The people are, are not finding that there's a solution to their problem and they're writing a uh, report and market about it. So my next step is probably to try to make that more discoverable by, by communicating in more ways, in different ways. Something to think about. Just to finish up here, I wanna leave you with a quote by a guy named Jonathan Blow. 
um, he's a developer of a game called Braid, which is a pretty awesome game. Uh, and he says, it's not so much about innovation as exploring interestingness. This has been a really instructive quote for me for the last year or two, because what he's talking about is that your game needs to be interesting. The, the way you define quality of a game is, is by whether or not it's interesting to users. That might be a function of technology, or it might be a function of innovative game mechanics nobody's ever seen before, or it might be art style or, or good writing or something like that. Um, whatever it takes, make sure the game is interesting and the users will come. So last but not least, here's the Wavelink again. Uh, there's some Google Moderator stuff up here. I'll put the questions up in just a second. I'm also going to accept questions from the mics, wherever they are. Um, we have about 15 minutes for questions. And here's the, the source code. But first, if you've never written anything for Android before, then you might be kind of wondering what the heck I'm talking about for this talk. But developer.android.com is where to start. Um, and uh, sprite method test is another profile test I wrote for, for 2D testing. That source and the height map profile I talked about today are up on this Apps for Android project at, um, uh, on Google Code. And then ReplicaIsland.net has links to the, the game and source and, uh, oops, and uh, other things about the game if you're interested. All the sources available under Apache too. So if you'd like to use it to make your own games, go for it. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to Google Moderator here. And I apologize for the small screen, but I totally set it up wrong. Okay, let's do a, is there a question on the mic first? I think you sir over here. Um, I was just wondering if you had any comments about um, Audio for games, sure. and then um, FPUs. Um, you know, some devices, or about half of the devices, don't have them. And right. Do they have? Right. So the question is, um, what to do about audio for games, and, and what about devices that support for FPUs? Um, most games, the way they want to play audio is either by playing a streaming music track or by playing sound effects. And there's both of those uh, APIs are available. They're only available from Java, though. Um, for playing streaming music, you probably want to use the uh, media player object. And for playing sound effects, there's an object called sound pool, which will allow you to load a bunch of samples and then fire them off, and it's got a priority system. And it's basically exactly what most, I think, game engines will implement themselves. Now, if you're writing your code in C++, you can't talk to those uh, systems directly. So the normal mode that, that game developers I've worked with are doing is they're either doing all the mixing themselves in C++ and passing a PCM stream up to a media player, which is fine if you already have mixing code, or if you just like to let the Android framework do it, you could either just call into Java from C++ using JNI, or you could just write the sort of sound invocation code in Java. Um, on the point about FPUs, that's true. Some devices have it, some devices do not. Um, the tests that I've seen suggest that there's no benefit in Java to writing code in fixed point, because the VM's version of, or whatever code that you write um, to do sort of fixed point emulation is going to be as, fa as slow or, or the same speed as the, the software emulator that's already running in native code. So if you're writing in Java, don't worry about it. Just use floating point. That's what I did. I didn't, I didn't ever worry about it. Um, if you're writing code in, in native code, then, then yeah, there's some things you want to you be, um, you, you want to be cognizant that there is no uh, floating point device on a lot of devices. And that will probably pretend, continue to be, to be true. Uh, if you can detect that there is floating point uh, hardware by the name of the architecture or something like that, you could use it. My suspicion is that you don't need to worry about it too much. And if you really have high performance code, then you're probably using fixed point already, even in native code. OK, so question over here. Yes, uh, just wondering whether you have any suggestion if uh, you write to target the third generation or fourth generation of device. Uh, for example, the next uh, Android release or even like uh, device with a different processor other than ARM. So you're talking about the emulator? You're uh, not the emulator, on the real device. I'm sorry, could you ask the question again? So uh, kind of in the future, uh, next or uh, future generation, you probably have like Android 2.2 and, and so forth. And right. also the device for your know, smartphone could be using uh, like uh, x86 or MIPS sure. uh, kind of processors. Sure. So any suggestion if you would like to target 
sure. that kind of device. Um, so, and so the question is, if you want to target devices that don't exist yet or haven't come out yet that are not running on ARM uh, processors, how do, you, how do you do it? Basically, you can figure it out yourself. Uh, the, the NDK is based on um, GDB, and if you go and look at the, the make scripts inside of the NDK, you could probably figure out how to build a, um, a uh, application for that, for that architecture. Now, the thing is, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the framework for loading different ABIs, and we're going to have to support that before you can really easily target those ABIs. So what I would suggest is, um, by the time a significant device that supports another architecture comes out, the NDK will have support for that. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. If you're on the cutting edge, then you're on the cutting edge. Uh, but if you're a regular developer, you know, we will have software development kits and stuff ready for you by the time those devices are, are going to ship. Okay, I'm going to take a question from the moderator thing here, if I can. Oh, that's fantastic. Yay. Okay. This is awesome. Okay. So I looked at this before, and it looks like this question about Replica Island having benefited from pre-release with few blowable levels and no story to build up excitement for the game, or where that have frustrated users. That's, people are totally ambivalent about that question, but it has a lot of votes, so I'm going to answer it. Um, so I did, did pre-release Replica Island to a limited number of users, all beta test users. I didn't do it on market. The story uh, actually was written first. I wrote the story before I did any of the level design or anything else. So cutting the story out would not have saved me time. Maybe this questioner is asking about uh, if I could have cut the story out as a reason for users to come back after a public beta. I, I don't know. Um, I think that users who download something on Android Market and leave it installed are interested in that app. And you can continue to ship updates to them very easily over Android Market. So it seems like a public beta thing could sort of work. In my particular case, uh, I felt like the game was pretty solid when I shipped it. And immediately when I found out that, say, users who had experience couldn't play, I tried to make modifications to help them. Um, I don't know if it would have benefited from a pre-release or not, but I don't think it would have benefited me in terms of uh, development time. The, the, the test I did with users to get feedback from on the levels was very useful, but I didn't use Android Market for that. I just sent them the APK. OK, question over here. So uh, when you were talking about your tips and tricks, there were a bunch of things you listed. And one of them was, it doesn't make sense to go to the NDK just for op open jail calls. Yeah. And yeah. I remember last year, you mentioned you had a graph yeah. of how expensive each function call is. And yep. JNI was way up there. Yep. So it seems to me that it would make sense to kind of bundle them into one, since the open jail calls are just JNIs, as yeah. far as I understand. So why is that, that it's not valuable? I thought so, too. So the question is, so um, I, didn't, I didn't touch on it, but I said in this slide that one of the tests I did with the height map profiler is I wrote the whole renderer in, in Java, and then I wrote the whole same code in uh, C++ to see what the difference between the uh, NDK version of the renderer and the Java version of the renderer was. And it turned out there was almost no difference. And that's because I wasn't doing anything CPU intensive with the, uh, with the NDK. If you're just calling into OpenGL, it's just going to, if you call it from Java, it's just going to jump down into native code anyway. So the question is, you know, why isn't there a huge performance benefit to skipping all of those individual JNI calls and having one function that does the calls from, from the code? And there is a small delta. Um, it actually turns out to be less than a millisecond even in the worst case test, in this particular test. Now, I don't have a lot of state to set in this thing. I don't have a lot of GLs to, GL calls to make. So if you are the type of application that has hundreds of thousands of GL calls to make every frame, then JNI overhead is probably something you want to be cognizant of. Um, for my particular taste, you know, I want to set up all the state ahead of time, and I want to issue as few calls as possible, because that's the fastest way to draw, especially for a test like this. Um, and in that case, you know, none of that is really CPU intensive. All the time is, is waiting on the driver to say, yes, I'm done setting your state, or yes, I'm doing, doing whatever. So calling it from the NDK is not a benefit. Um, and actually, using the NDK closes off um, you know, which platforms. If, if you know, some theoretical x86 platform shipped in the future, then unless I recompile my code, that NDK code is not going to work. So I've sort of boxed myself in a little bit. So the point there is, if you're going to use native code, do something that's CPU intensive with it. Um, JNI overhead is not a hugely CPU intensive thing. It does exist. Um, but you know, do your physics calculation, or, or do your scene graph walking, or whatever it is that, that is expensive to do in an interpreted language. Do that in the native code. Don't just issue GL commands. Okay, thanks. Okay, over here. Um, if you need to add a video stream, be it from a camera or a media file, into your graphics, um, how would you do it? Um, let's say it's a VGA size, what kind of performance do you expect? 
So you're saying uh, read, on, read from a media file into... Or a, or a camera stream, live camera stream coming in. Do you mean specifically into, um, into GL memory or yes, into... Yes, into okay. GPU. So the question is how to get bitmaps into OpenGL fast, right? Yes, exactly. Um, so there's only really one way to do it. <laughs> That's to set them as a texture. I mean, you can set a render target and copy them there. There's a GL subtexture image, and there's also a, like GLU2, GLU tils will give you an option for copying the textures in. That's generally not a fast operation, um, and it's pretty much bus bound as far as I can tell. So the answer is don't do that if you can avoid it. Um, I mean, preload all your all your textures, and when you get this call to a surface change, load them again. Now, in the case of a camera or something like that, I think it's going to be pretty difficult. Um, I think that you can do it, and I think that you can do it at a frame rate that is, um, you know, above 15 frames a second, but probably not on the current hand round of the current range of hardware anyway at, at 30 frames a second because the, the bus is going to get saturated. And also, in the when you're in a case where you know the hardware is waiting for this copy to complete, then any other sort of context switch or interrupt, like an event callback, is going to be much more expensive than it would be in a regular game. Um, so my recommendation is if you plan on sort of loading textures at runtime as the game is running or as the simulation is running, then you should expect that to be very expensive. What about, uh, you mentioned draw texture. I wasn't familiar with it. Is it? So draw texture, right. So draw texture takes a, a, um, a texture that's already been loaded into GL memory and just draws it. It's basically the same as making a quad and making orthographic projection camera and, and saying draw, but you don't have to do any of that stuff. You just say draw this texture and you give it a scale and an XYZ and, and that's all it does. Uh, and, and probably inside the driver it does make a quad, but it's much faster for it to do it there than for you to do it in code. So. Thank you. Okay, I'll take a question from moderator if I can make it scroll correctly. Uh, so let's see. There's a question about Android market in other countries and there's a question about Flash 10. Um, so real quick about Flash. I don't know anything about Flash. Uh, I'm, I'm involved in the game developer side of things and, and not the framework and I don't work at Adobe. So um, I think that there's probably lots to learn about Flash at this conference, but I don't know what those things are. I do think that if you're gonna make a Flash game and you would like to bring it over to Android, um, the, you know, the simplest way to do it is probably to take whatever they're building and ship it. The problem with that is that you know, you're going to ship it to the devices that support Flash, which is going to be a very small subset of that graph that I showed you. So if you're interested in minimum time to ship, it sounds like a really good idea. If you're interested in just taking content you've already built and just getting it up on Android, sounds like a great first step. If you're interested in reaching every single Android user in the world, it might not be the, the way to go. That's about all I have to say about Flash. I have a very short amount of time remaining. So uh, if you have a question, please come up to the mic, because otherwise people won't be able to hear you. Any other mic questions? Okay, sir, nobody's coming to the mic, so speak loudly and I'll repeat it. Do you have any references on the best way to mix in text with OpenGL? Okay. Yeah, so the question is how do you mix in text with OpenGL? Uh, OpenGL is really bad at text, generally. Um, you can you know, make your texture with your uh, characters in it and then try to make quads to draw the texture. We actually have a demo in the uh, API demos that will we'll take the um, We'll, we'll take the Android sort of font system and rasterize some fonts into a texture and then you can use that to build quads and drink stuff. But it sucks because it's not international. It doesn't do, like, you won't be able to do UTF-8 stuff easily. If you want to support a language like Chinese, your textures are all going to become super huge all of a sudden. Um, if you just want to overlay text or just want to overlay any sort of regular view hierarchy stuff on top of um, OpenGL output, you can do that very easily using GL Surface View. GL Surface View is just going to be an element in your, in your view hierarchy, and you can put other elements in front of it. Um, in my game, I have a, a pause text that comes up, which is actually just an image, but it, it doesn't draw with OpenGL. It just draws with the regular Android image view system, and I just draw it right on top of the, the GL Surface. There's not a lot of overhead to doing that. So if you're just talking about compositing text on top of a GL scene, that's probably the way to go. Do I have time for one more question? Is that it? Okay, I think I'm out of time. Thank you very much for coming, and I'm looking forward to seeing all the games you guys are going to make. Thank you.